There we go. All right. Last week, the theme was the heart. We talked about the importance of a heart that is right. And how do we deal with our own knowledge of our own sinfulness? And we saw how that the King David did things that were terrible, things that we would never do, and yet he was called the man after God's own heart because those external things don't need to damage our hearts. However, there is a danger that they could, and we need to be aware. And so this morning, we let the preacher in Ecclesiastes speak to us from his heart. And tonight, your preacher is going to speak from his heart. And I was thinking we had last week and this week on the heart, and there would be two weeks, but in fact, it's going to be three. Just occurred to me. Because next Sunday, I'll be in North Carolina where Lee and Katie live and where they worship, and I'll be preaching for the weekend over there, and two of our shepherds are going to speak. And so what they say is also going to be from their hearts. So it's worked out really well for us to consider the heart. While we are going through all the things that we are, it is important that we constantly do heart check. And that's what this was all about. So tonight, I want you to listen to your preacher. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the text that was read. Notice what Paul says to the church at Corinth, and the same things that he said to them are on my heart to say to you. Now, admittedly, his situation and mine are different because he was a, an apostle of the Lord. He had miraculous abilities, and he could use those in and amongst them. And some of what he's talking about is in reference to those things. Verse 7, Paul said, I don't want you to do evil just so I am approved. Well, that's what I want to tell you. In the time that I preach, I don't preach trying to make sure that we're on the same page, not doing evil and staying away from sin and doing what's right so that everybody will say, well, that's a mighty fine preacher preaching that stuff. That's not the point. Paul said, that's not why I did. I, I don't want to do that for my approval. I want it because that's what you need to do, verse 7, to honor yourself. It's not about honoring the preacher. It's about honoring yourself. And in so doing, it's honoring God. Because number two, the truth is going to win. No matter whatever else is going on, no matter whatever else is presented, the truth will win. That's the nature of truth. Truth cannot lose. Truth can be pushed aside. Truth can be covered up, but truth will not lose. And if you're betting on truth losing, if I am counting on truth losing so that it helps or benefits me or benefits you, we're in trouble. I, I want you to know that the truth is going to win. Whether I get in the way of its presentation or whether I present it well, truth is going to win. Number three, 
any preacher worth his salt should be willing to say what Paul said here. Paul said, I am glad to be weak if you are strong. Now, I don't think he was saying, I'm glad to be weak spiritually. Remember I said his situation and mine are different. With his miraculous abilities, with his apostleship, he could do things with and for that church in ways that I could never do. And what I think he is saying is, I am willing not to do, make myself weak, not get involved there, if it means that you will be okay. There was some concern that Paul was really not an apostle and he had to defend himself all of the time. But I think he is saying it's not important about me attaining something or being proven right. If you are right, then I'll just sit in the background and I'll be fine. It's not about looking for approval. It's not about looking for compliments. It's not about looking for standing. It's about creating an environment where all of us are as strong spiritually as we can be. And finally, verse 10. But if I need to be sharp, I'll be sharp. If I need to say this is wrong, it has to stop, we have to change, can't do this, I don't mind being sharp. That's what Paul said. If I need to be clearly sharp and to the point, even maybe upsetting people in order to speak the truth, If it's the presentation that upsets people, I will apologize. But if it's the message that upsets, I'm not going to back up for a second. Now, that is the environment for me to say what I want to say about this church as your preacher. These are things, and I could spend hours talking about our time together in 30 years. And I know the heart of this church. I know the heart of this church because I've been here, lived here, been around you. And the heart of this church has stayed the same Primarily because of the shepherding that we have had through this entire time. That's why. Their desire, one and only, has been that as a church we be a certain way. Without getting involved in the affairs of anybody else. Just us. So I know the heart of this church. But recently, I think this church has proven its heart again. I know the heart of this church financially. By the way, you don't have an outline because the computer died. I've texted Eric, but I'm willing to let anybody here who knows anything more than I work on my computer be glad for you too. But I also thought I wouldn't do an outline anyway because I'm not sure what I'm going to say anyway. So the outline might not even be effective. But here's how I think it has been. During these two years, year and a half, I have seen the heart of this church financially. It makes no sense 
difference to a lot of people that we are about to start a major construction project. Not these people, because we're ready to go, but people who talk to me. I meet with the area preachers once a month. And it's amazing. It is amazing that we are where we are financially when we've been through what we have been through. It really is. Because there has been a disconnect from being here. But that disconnect of being present has not disconnected from our people giving to the work of the Lord and the work of this church. And because of that, our shepherds say, let's get moving. We have never had a need go unanswered in all of these years. It would not even be possible, I don't think, to add up the money and the in-kind contributions of service that our people have given to help financially people who are in need. It literally is astounding. I know the heart of this church financially. I know the heart of this church as a body of people. I know that this church is not interested in numbers for the sake of numbers. I know that as a group of people, we're not here trying to figure out, now, compared to that church, how big are we? And, and the numbers they have, how, how much are our numbers? I know that that's not a concern of this church. It's always been the case. But what I'm talking about is, I know that this church wants to welcome anybody who wants to come and be a part. And I hear all the time people who are talking to friends and acquaintances and inviting them to come and see what's going on. Phil could give you the number, but you realize in the past, well, I think he's doing the new members dinner back to about five years or something. I don't know what the number is. But in the past year, during these difficult times, I've heard people say, I've been away because of COVID, and when I come back, I don't recognize a third of the people. And it's not just the masks. It's the fact that we've got new people. And this church wants to be a body. 1 Corinthians 12, the body is one, like Christ is one, even though we have many members. So I know this church wants to be the body of Jesus. And I know this church heart is a heart of fellowship. On a large scale or on small scales, I think there is a fellowship atmosphere here that's really good. I just really like what Howard Mead is doing right now. I really, I really like his thought process, his ideas, his intention to get us together. And during these times, we're starting to get back. And we're having group actions and group activities and small group activities. And I think we as a people have a heart of fellowship. Financially, that's exactly what happened in 2 Corinthians 8 when Paul congratulated the Macedonians because they gave immensely out of their own poverty. I know your heart financially. The church in Corinth, though it had 
so many problems and so much trouble, they were still one body and they were one like Christ was, 1 Corinthians 12. I know your heart as a body. And in Acts 2, that church, when it was formed, they were steadfast together, breaking bread from house to house, eating their food with simplicity and gladness of heart. And the Lord added to them daily those who were being saved. I know your heart of fellowship. That's what I know about the heart of this church. But I also know that while things should not or don't have to affect the heart or damage it, David would not have said, oh, go ahead and do that stuff and still be after the heart of God. Solomon this morning said, I'm telling you, don't get involved in this stuff because it'll mess you up. It'll mess up your heart if you stay there. And there comes a time when we have to say, is our heart okay? Look at Hebrews chapter 3. And I want to warn you about the hardness of the heart. I want to give you some warning. Even though I know the heart of this church as a whole, I, I want to speak to all of us as individuals. Those who are here and those who are there, talking to you too. Here are some concerns. They're not major flags that say we're really heading down the track and it's broken off. We're going to go into the abyss. But I have some concerns. And these don't have to be the kinds of things that will damage our congregational heart. But our hearts individually, if they're not as solid as they can be, the church heart is not as solid as it can be. Verse 7, the writer says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore... I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They've not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they did not intend to be hardened. An alcoholic did not take the first drink intending to be an alcoholic. Nobody told a lie intending to be known from then on as a liar. But he said, I'm giving you a warning. There are three facets of life that we need to consider that are mentioned in this text. Number one, there's you and God, me and God. If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I think there is a danger that could, if we're not careful, that could have damaging effect on some hearts and their relationship with God. 
if people will continue to settle for substitutes. Our AV team has been a blessing, not only to this church, but to untold thousands of people even worldwide. They just have been. But if people from the time we move forward are satisfied to substitute being online for having been in presence with God here with the group, I think that's dangerous. I think it's dangerous. I think there are habits that may have been created because of what we've been through that are going to be hard to break if we're not careful. Substitutes are not like the substance. We were talking in our Bible class this morning about that. And there are ways in which that happens that maybe we don't think about one that we do. One of the things about religious world seems to me to be an emphasis on entertainment when they get together. And people just watch. Somebody else is singing, somebody else is doing, somebody else, just watch. Substituting my own involvement for letting someone else do it. That happens online. If you're online, because you need to be, but you're going about your business while streaming what we're doing here in the background. And you're going on with your life, cooking dinner, cleaning the house. You're substituting. It's not going to work. The Lord won't accept that. But you know what? It happens here too. Because when we're in worship, if you're not worshiping, you're substituting letting somebody else worship for you. If you don't sing, how is that any different than a church that chooses to have a group do all the singing for them? How is that any different? If you're not involved in the presentation of the gospel, maybe you didn't even bring a Bible. Or maybe the Bible's on your phone. But you know what? While I'm there, I think I'll check my email. You're substituting. Those kinds of things that continue can harden a heart spiritually. And from the heart of your preacher, let's be aware of that. Let's think about what that's doing to our relationship with God. Number two, verse 10. They always go astray in their heart not having known my ways. The second part of life is the relationship that you have with yourself. Do you know the Lord? Do you know what He wants? These people didn't know 
Well, they didn't know because they didn't listen. I get that. But let's say you have listened. But it's not been implanted. It's not set. Do you know Scripture? It is important for us to understand that I need to know myself what's right and wrong. I need to understand for me what is acceptable. I need to know my faith. I need to know what I believe. I need to know where I am. It's not good enough to say I'm a part of the Richmond church. As though the mere membership in the church at Richmond somehow gives you your faith. It's not going to work that way haven't known me, he said, haven't known my word, has the time that we have been away also taken you away from your own Bible study? Now some admittedly have said it's even better because, you know, we didn't have anything else to do so we studied the Bible. Okay, whatever has to happen. You know, Paul said, whether Christ is preached out of envy or selfishness, I don't care, just as long as he's preached. But a heart can be hardened if we're not careful. If you had been active in a Bible class offered here, but now you're not, That's a danger to me. If you've been active in the times that we gather here together and you're not now, that's a danger point. Now granted, if health issues are a concern, we're not talking about that. But I am concerned when every phase of life comes back except this. I'm concerned. Am I comfortable enough with what I know that I don't need to study anymore? Think anymore? Listen to? That's the great thing about Bible classes here. You get the perspective of so many different people. That's the powerful thing. And it's beneficial to me knowing me in my heart what I think is right. And it's a danger point to a hardened heart if I'm not careful. Third, finally, verse 13, exhort one another daily while it is called today. The third face of life is You and the brethren. You and the brethren. I am concerned. I am concerned that though we know we are familiar with each other, that we might not really be family. I'm concerned. Part of that, obviously, is because we haven't been together very much. And what I want to know and what I want you to ask yourself is, are you okay with that? Do you miss it? Do you miss the kinds of gatherings and activities we used to have for years? Does it make you sad? Or are you just now, okay, it's a new era. We'll be familiar with each other. But we're not going to really be family with each other. If that doesn't bother you, I think you ought to check your heart.
when assembly with the saints is a matter of convenience and not commitment, I think there's a problem. Can I stand up here and say, if a Christian is not in Bible class on Sunday morning and in worship, Sunday night worship and Wednesday night, that you're on a path to hell? Can't say it. Wouldn't say it. But what I'm concerned about is, have we now created some habits that we would not have had before? And now we're just okay with it. Because when we were not here, we weren't even meeting together. How easy was it to fill that time in a different way? How easy was it? And is that time still being filled in a different way? Or do you want to get back to what it used to be? Just ask the question. I'm concerned that newer people, younger people, aren't stepping in to certain things, and the older, mature ones aren't stepping out. I hear both sides of that. Well, we can't do it because these older ones have been doing it for so long, they won't let go of it and, and let us work. And the older ones say, well, nobody down there wants to do anything. Those young ones don't want to step up. They don't want to get involved. We're just having to hang on. I hear it from both sides. Obviously, there's something wrong. You know what's wrong? We're not talking. And I'm going to put this on the older, mature people. In areas of ministry and work, we need to take it on ourselves to reach out to these younger families, these newer members, and invite them to come and be involved. Mentor them, but then let them have it. It's time, people. It's time for the new and the younger to step up. It's time for the older and mature to help them do it. And I'm concerned that without it, some of those things will damage our hearts. My final concern Where's the leadership of this church going to come from in years to come? Where is it? I'm talking to you men for a minute. I think we've badly taught 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. And we sort of taught, not sort of, we have taught that as the first qualification to be an elder in the Lord's church is to desire it. It's not what that verse says. That's not what he's saying at all. It has nothing to do with it. Here's what it's saying. If a man steps up and says, I'll serve as an elder, don't you look down on him because he has that desire. That's a good thing. So I'm calling on you guys tonight. We need men who are going to say, I desire to serve this church as a shepherd. You may be years down the road because of your family situation, but get ready now. I've been talking to our shepherds that we have right now about coming to you and saying, we think you can do this someday. 
Let us help you now start preparing. Young men, it's time. And you guys that aren't even married, time. Don't you wait 30 years down the road and then decide, okay, I'm not ready to get ready to be an elder. Start now. Same with deacons, Bible class teachers. It is a shame to have a church as big as this. And we can't get enough teachers to teach our children. It's just a shame. It hurts my heart. Now I know not all the children are back yet. I get it. But they're coming. But I know the people in charge can't find teachers. It's just a shame. It hurts my heart. And I'm concerned that if it stays in that direction, individual hearts could be hardened. If you're online, live or recorded later, if you've not been back at all, since COVID started. Do you intend to? Do you still consider yourself a part of this church? Being here is important. And that has nothing to do with the things that keep people from being here. We accept all of those. But all I'm saying is, let's make sure that our hearts individually don't get crusted over because of things that we've had to do have been forced on us that were not our doing. There are so many people in this room who gave their lives to this church far longer than I have. Some twice as long as I have. And they wouldn't change it for anything in the world. But every now and then, we need to have a heart to heart. And I hope it helps. Because I'm your preacher. And I really feel these things that we've been talking about. And I hope that as we start through the end of this year and heading into a new one, that we will really emphasize spiritual growth next year. And while we're growing physically and structurally, that we bolster that with spiritual growth. Well, now you know. You also know what is next. If you're not a child of God, why not tonight? If you're hanging out there in the danger zone, why don't you come on back? Our shepherds will be here as we stand and sing.